I grew up in the north also, and I never heard of Verena, and I knew nothing about the southern uh, side of the Civil War. So I wanted to find some new information, which I didn't have before I started doing all this. Now Verena, um, her name is Verena Ann Howell, and they spelled her name uh, V-A-R-I-N-A, but it's kind of, when they pronounced it, it was like a French name, Varina, and it was V-A-R-E-E -E with an accent sign on the second E and N-A. She was born May 7, 1826 in Natchez, Mississippi. So she was a true Southerner. And her, um, I'll tell you, her, she was named after a very good friend of her mother that had the same name, Verena Ann Brooks. Um, her mother, and I had to have this all written down so I could do it real easily, but what I, did, I lost that piece of paper sometimes along the line unless I put it on the back. Oh, she, she was the daughter of William Burrow Howell, and she was the first girl to be born in that family. Um, her mother had a, a total of 11 children, and she was the, the second child, and she had one brother older than her. So when she grew up, she did a lot of the work around the house, even though they did have slaves. She learned how to sew, cook, and things like that, which you wouldn't think Southerners would learn because of all the slaves that were available. And um, her father um, had many jobs, but he wasn't very successful. So it was a good thing he married uh, Marina's mother, who came from a fairly wealthy family in the South. And um, her um, grandfather was Mayor, um, Major uh, Richard Howell, who was a um, Revolutionary War veteran from uh, Delaware. And then later, uh, he went into law and became a uh, governor of New Jersey. So her grandfather really was a nor northerner, where her mother was a true um, uh, southerner. And her mother uh, was a Quaker. Uh, William Byrd's father um, served in the War of 1812 and settled in Miss Mississippi after the war was over and married Margaret Louise Kempel and that was a very wealthy Southern family. And that family gave us a dowry to um, them, um, money and a home, and this is what kind of saved that family, getting all the things from the, uh, from the Kempels. Um, she uh, went to a private school in uh, Pennsylvania, and the name of that school was in, was in Philadelphia, and um, it was called Madam Greenlaw's um, private <coughs> seminary and she went there for two years when she was age 10 to 12 and I don't know if they ran out of money money or something and they brought her back home after that and then she was more or less educated by a family friend Judge George Winchester who was a private uh, he was a lawyer but he also was a private teacher to Verena when she was a student in the school in Philadelphia, she learned Latin, French, literature, moral philosophy, and she just seemed to have a natural thing for learning. I look back on her life and think of my own life, and I can't imagine learning all those subjects between the age of 10 and 12. <laughs> I mean, I learned a little bit of Latin I learned when I was a freshman, sophomore, and junior in high school, but I can, at age 10, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. I didn't get it anyway, but <laughs> um, but maybe I didn't have that natural intelligence. Um, the family had as their friend uh, Joseph Davis, who um, had a big plantation in Mississippi, and uh, he had a brother, a younger brother, Jefferson Davis, and uh, Joseph thought that. Uh, that uh, Jefferson should meet uh, Verena, but she was only uh, really 17 years old when she met Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was almost twice her age. He was like 36, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Verena's mother was only 37, so Jefferson Davis was like a year younger than her mother. Um, but they must have thought he was a good catch. 
So what they did uh, one year, when she was only 17, they sent her to the plantation, which was called Hurricane, and um, to meet uh, Jefferson Davis. And in, at first she really didn't like him because he was so opinionated and everything he did was right. And she seemed to be a little bit set in her ways and she wasn't taking anything from <coughs> men, I guess. Uh, but one, uh, a few days they went horseback riding and she was a terrific horseback rider. So they spent afternoons riding in the fields and talking. And then in the evening time, they'd come back to the plantation and uh, she would read to him, Jefferson Davis, and Jefferson Davis read to her. And they kind of liked doing that. And um, what was the other thing? Oh, uh, when she was in the plantation, she found one room that had a beautiful piano. They didn't tell us what type of piano it was. But uh, she played the piano, and that impressed Jefferson Davis. So before that Christmas holiday was over, they fell in love, and they wanted to get engaged. But her mother was kind of against it to begin with, uh, because number one, she was 18, and she wasn't even quite 18 at that time. She was only 17, and he was 36. Mm -hmm. And so she left the plantation, the hurricane plantation, and went back to her own home, and they did plan a wedding because uh, she had gotten engaged and she got this beautiful engagement ring. Mm. And she does have a picture there of it. It's an emerald and it's surrounded with diamonds and it was gold. But they still waited for this wedding, but they planned a wedding with a beautiful white dress and a veil and they were going to have this huge reception uh, at their plantation. But uh, during that, uh, three or four or eight months. Uh, Verena even had like a nervous breakdown, so that made her mother want to wait even longer. And then they decided not to have the big wedding and just have an ordinary wedding, invite a few friends and get married. And so that's what they did. And they were married in February uh, 1845 on the 26th of February. Um, they were married for seven years before she had any children. She had their first child, a son, in 1852, which they named Samuel. Um, she had her first daughter in 1855, and they named the daughter Margaret, but called her Maggie. Um, a total of, in the family, she had uh, six children, and like um, Mary Todd Lincoln, she had, I think, four boys. But uh, Verena had uh, two daughters and uh, I think three or four sons. Uh, she lived to be 80, and she outlived all her children except <coughs> one. Because back then, they didn't have the medical care that they have today. Uh, <coughs> some of them died of malaria, uh, yellow fever. One Samuel, the very first son, fell on the porch and died from probably a head injury. Um, this is the other thing that I thought was very, um, oh, what's very similar, and this happened before the, uh, the wedding, uh, Jefferson Davis was married once before, and uh, his first wife, they were only married a year, had no children, and his wife died from malaria. Just like uh, Mary Todd uh, Lincoln, Lincoln had a, a lover, um, Ann Rutledge, they didn't never got married, but she died of malaria too during their courtship. So that marriage never took place where Jefferson David's um, marriage took place. So after the wedding he and the death of his wife he was very depressed and was more or less like a bachelor living in his uh, hurricane plantation. She begins life under uh, rather a cloud and a person that we are going to see several times in this is Joseph Davis. This is the brother, the older brother who owns the plantation. And actually some research indicates that it was his idea to invite Verena to visit the plantation. Verena and her husband now settle into a, another plantation, but the plantation is in Joseph's name. The result of which is Verena sometimes gets surprised guests arriving, other parts of the family who will be living there for a while. 
and any idea that she is then going to be an independent owner of her own home never exists. And that fight continues all through Verena's life. About this time, Jefferson Davis is uh, um, elected to office and goes to Washington. Verena, after some time, is invited by him to join her in Washington. Now we remember what life was like for people then. If you were a married woman, you did not travel by train or any other way by yourself. You always had an escort. That's something that we'll need to remember as we go on farther into life. Farina now arrives in Washington, where she is in her dream period. She is a wonderful, gregacious person. I love the, the um, comments on her. She is of Welch origin, and so the explanation, she is an olive skin. Now, I, too, am of Welch origin, and I've <laughs> seen very few Welsh people with olive complexions. But she, that was something that was commented about her all through her lifetime. She was readily accepted in uh, all forms of political life and became a great political hostess. Then politics of the time appeared and the separation of the states occurred. Want to get into first lady? I will. Yeah. Jefferson Davis now is going to be the new president of the Confederacy, keeping in mind that he must renounce his American citizenship. Also an interesting thing, since after the war he travels all over without a passport. Amazing to me. Verena then moves to Richmond, and she is in Richmond while the entire Civil War project is going on, uh, helping in veterans hospitals, Remember, she considers herself, she has a term that she uses called half-breed. It's because a good part of her family came from the North, in fact, fought in the American Revolution. So we are now into this touching situation where the Southern states are going to secede. And here is Verena, born in the South, educated in the North, with many relatives in the North, and her husband is the president of the Confederacy. The war goes on. Farina <clears throat> has some doubts as to how economically the South is prepared to fight in this war. Um, but the patriotism of many of the Southern plantation class of people, and, and class is the term I think that we have to use, was very much in favor of the secession and of them going into the Civil War. The war drags on longer than people had thought, and eventually the South must secede. Must say that it is going to lose the entire battle. Gettysburg had been an indication that this was going to happen. But the lack of supplies and every other thing made it almost inevitable that the southern states would lose. So we now find Verena at the end of the Civil War. Um, she is an outcast, technically, as is her whole family. And her husband, who has been idolized in the South, is now going to be arrested as a traitor to his country. Those things got worse and worse, and we know the war is ending. They started making plans, and the main plan being that she should head for Florida and try to take a ship to a foreign country. Her husband's going to go to Texas and keep on fighting. And there were, at that time, Joe Johnston's army and a lot of others that were heading 
that way, and that was a plan, and they also wanted to support Maximilian in Mexico, so more politics are involved in this. So the end of March, she leaves, because the Union Army is right outside, and just about to come into Richmond. She has about $2,000 in gold, a revolver, and some books. She ended up leaving behind most of her household goods, gave away what she could, and took off with several people. She had um, her brother with her, her sister Margaret, various family and friends, and, um, and two household slaves. And she's got a brother that they call Jeffy D. And he is Jefferson Davis Howell, but they call him Jeffy. And they were in a big hurry, trying to stay ahead of the Yankees, and day by day, state by state, and in and out of most of the states. And you think about the travel, they are trying to take um, trains if they can find them. There aren't that many railroad lines left. Uh, carriages if possible, looking for boats. And how are they going to get from here to there? You might do 10 miles a day, you might do $20 and more, 20, 20 miles or more. This is what Richmond looked like and before it got in really bad shape. And it was the Confederates who did the burning in Richmond that you see in the, in the movies. And the Yankees came in and just destroyed everything that could be used. And she heard, as they were on their way, she heard of Lincoln's assassination and really felt bad about it. She did not know that the government believed that Jefferson Davis was involved and they had offered a $100,000 reward for his capture. Mm -hmm. And he was, and it says amount, in today's cash, multiplied by about 40. And that will tell you what he <coughs> was worth. So they were <coughs> off on their travels, just her, and her husband didn't leave until the beginning of April. And Lee said, get out of town. He said, okay, then he hears a few days later, well, about two weeks later, that Lee has surrendered. Okay, I guess it's over, so. And they are kind of paralleling. They're heading the same way, but he's behind by a few weeks. And she's traveling with this group of people. And they were bothered seven, a couple of times by people, but they were aided by locals. And you gotta figure, they're Southerners. This is the president's wife, so people would give them money. They might give them food. Why don't you stay here for a day and rest and relax because this is such a drag. Because she's got three children with her, too in this and um, they were lucky to have some friends there and the letter writing they were constantly sending notes back and forth I'm here where are you what's going on this is what we're doing we're heading for the next town on the list and not even knowing if the notes got to the other one some did some didn't but there were always some couriers there were some soldiers with them she was also part of what they called the treasury train which means this group of soldiers and such took all the money out of Richmond and they're heading that down for Texas or Mexico, wherever they might end up, so they would have funds. So by early May, they get into so southern central Georgia, way down there, practically into Florida. Good, the end is in sight, we're doing fine. Jefferson Davis and his party joins up, and they are so glad to see each other. He planned to leave, he said, I'm gonna sleep here tonight, Tomorrow I'm heading out for Texas and you keep on. So they pitched their tents by the roadside. And this has been a scary, nervous, awful traveling. That This was six weeks from when they left Richmond. And woke up to find out they were surrounded by two U.S. cavalry units. It's called, whoops, we are going nowhere. Mm -hmm. About 15 grown-ups and five children. So There's two different stories about the capture. One is that Jefferson Davis was in his riding clothes, so she tried to disguise him by throwing a raincoat over him and draping a shawl over his head, and sent him towards the woods with a slave girl. So it just looked like a guy going off with, to protect this girl while she went out to get water or something. A soldier came along, told him to stop. She ran out, threw her arms around him because she was afraid the guy would shoot him. The other story is that she begged him to leave. He grabbed a raincoat, which they called a raglan, that style it was in, which happened to be hers. Couldn't find his hat, grabbed the shawl, and ended up seeing a trooper on horseback and says to himself, I'm going to knock this guy off because he doesn't know who I am, grab his, grab his horse and leave. And the soldier then aims the gun at him. Well, maybe not. So she does the same thing. She puts her body out there to protect her husband. 
And it, my, one of my thoughts was, think about Abraham Lincoln going to Washington. What are the rumors about him? That he wore women's clothes. Because somebody threw a shawl over his head one day, <laughs> one part of one trip. <laughs> oh, he had on women's clothes, he's no good. Oh, he wore women's clothes, you know. What's the, and it's, it's just another interesting conjunction of the families. One of the others being that Verena and all her northern relatives and Mary Todd Lincoln had family and friends who lived, and relatives that lived in the yeah. south. Yeah. So, and it's just, that's, but that's the way the times were. People lived all over and had family all over. So then they take the long way, kind of. They went from Macon to Atlanta by rail from Atlanta to Augusta, then down the Savannah River to the ocean, and then north back up towards Washington, D.C. So if you've been to Williamsburg, you know where it is. The end of that peninsula is where we're going to end up. At that time, a friend named Clement Clay and his wife joined them. They come back into the story later. They're just a little bit, little part of this. At Augusta, the former vice president, Alexander Hamilton Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, was added to the group. So they get up to Hampton Roads, and they're all the way up there now, near the end of May. And at this point, Stevens and the Postmaster General were put on the ship to Boston and Fort Warren. Jeff E. D. Howell and several others were taken off to Fort McHenry, which is near Baltimore, which left Mr. Clay and President Davis, and they were taken to what was then called Fortress Monroe, is now called Fort Monroe. And that's what the fort looked like. It has a moat around it. It still does. I was there two weeks ago. And you go over a bridge to get in there, and you can ride around inside. And they just took them across and brought him in. So it was, it was basically impregnable. There was no way he was going anywhere if he got out of there. There were just one or two little bridges to the land, and all the rest of this is out there. And all the em embankments up around the fortress is still there. So they put him in a cell. And that's pretty much the size of it. It's called a casemate, and it's semicircular, and the whole side wall of the building is all these casemates. And there's a, like a walkway between. You can see the, the formation of it, and that's the one he was in. It was number two. And he had a bed and a small table, a chair, and not much else. Now there's two windows and a, bigger windows and a door, but I think it was just small windows at the time. And it's about 50 steps yeah. this way by about 50 steps this way, because I paced it out. So it's in my, <laughs> my little feet. And just about as far back as, as, as she is, there's a soldier in there all the time. And lights. They had sentry inside the cell and two out. Under constant supervision at this point, you know, uh, no privacy, sparse furnishings, light on all night. Guards changing every two hours. So how much sleep did the man get? Initially, they had him manacled, and we think it was just done to humiliate him and say you are now the lowest of the low because you got manacles like a slave. And after about five days, enough of commotion, and they were removed. Two months later, the night lamp and the guard were removed, but they're still outside the cell. He was allowed to exercise outdoors, although he wouldn't, could not be alone and he could not talk to his friend, Mr. Clay. He was always with someone, but he was around to do a little bit of walking. So shortly after he got, Davis got taken off, Virginia, uh, Verena, excuse me, I don't know Virginia in here. Verena, her sister Margaret Howell, and Virginia Clay was still on the boat waiting to be transferred. And can I go be with my husband? Forget it, lady, you're not going anywhere near him. One day, two women come into the room and strip search them. He didn't think this happened except in these days, saying they were looking for treasonous documents. This is Verena Day. And this is Verena and Margaret Howell, her sister, and Virginia Clay. Wow. And this was definitely meant to humiliate them. None of the men were searched, just the, just the three women, which is pretty bad. Well, women weren't, you know, status was a little lower than men anyway. They believe that General Miles was behind this because he definitely was a very strong unionist. So Verena Quick, while they were still there, wrote a letter trying to get sanctuary on an English ship. The letter was intercepted and sent to Secretary Stanton, who did not like the Davises at all, at the War Department. 
the women were put on a ship with 200 paroled Southerners and sent south to Savannah. General Miles sent a note north saying, the females have been sent to Savannah. On arrival, he's not a nice man. On arrival, they were taken to a nearby hotel where she had to pay her own board out of the thousand or so dollars she had left. She didn't want to go out during the daytime because she wasn't sure how she'd be accepted or anything. So she'd go out at night accompanied by a black employee and always followed by soldiers who were on guard duty. And eventually there was name calling and verbal bullying of her three oldest children. And she was able to send them to Montreal to her mother, to her mother. The cover, is, and Montreal figures in because the Confederate government had been operating agents out of there during the war, so there were many supporters who offered them sanctuary and help financially. Later, her sister was sent to join them. She took a false bottom trunk, which had Davis's official letter book and other documents, and managed to sneak them through and got away with that. Marina thought about trying to escape, but was afraid she might never be allowed back in the country. She was also in charge of the family finances, and how Brother Joe didn't get around to taking that away from her, we don't know, but it's definitely unusual for a woman of her era, and with a brother-in-law like that, of course, he wasn't anywhere near to take over. She did hear from Judah Benjamin, he was the Secretary of the Treasury, I believe, under Jefferson Davis, that money was being held for them in, in England so that if they ever needed money, they could get some. This woman liked to write. She wrote letters to anybody and everybody, even knowing that they were perused and washed before they went out, but she knew Francis Blair, who was the father of Montgomery Blair, Postmaster General, uh, Horace Greeley, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Garrett Smith. These were all people of note, mostly Northerners, but were friends. Uh, Greeley sent a letter to a lawyer friend who went to Montreal and read her husband's papers, which helped prove that he was not involved with the assassination of Lincoln. Eventually, um, Davis was, Jefferson Davis was sent to the second floor of a nearby house, which was a little healthier. So early the following year, she was permitted to leave Savannah, could go anywhere she wanted to go in the whole world, except Fort Monroe. Travel differences from now is, you know, the trip took her from Savannah to Macon to New Orleans to Vicksburg, and that's, that was definitely all over the map, to New York City to be able to get to Montreal. I mean, why she couldn't go straight, and, you know, roads, whatever, at the time. She was told her husband was critically ill, so she wrote President Johnson, is it possible that you will keep me from my dying husband? You know. And he referred the letter to Secretary Stanton and said, eh, let's give her a permit to go visit him. So she was allowed to, and um, she spent six and a half hours in a small, open, cold room waiting for an escort into the fort. She asked General Miles about lodgings, and he suggested she move in with the local prostitutes. Now, if Miles sounds familiar, when you hear stories of Custer and others out west, Miles is the one who is associated with the saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. <coughs> was not a nice man. So she finally had, she had to sign a statement saying she wasn't going to bring in any deadly weapons. She had an interview with a general and finally allowed to see his husband and found his, his state shocking. He was thin. He did not look good. He was not was a little, you know, in, unstable. And they were eventually moved to four rooms in the kitchen at one end of a house building called Carroll Hall and he started to get a little healthier. So she went back to her, writing, her letter writing to her many friends and acquaintances, and Garrett was one who said he would raise no objection to the Attorney General's arranging for the prisoner's removal to civil custody. May 10th, 1867, the second anniversary of their capture. So this nightmare has been going on for two years. She probably wore her fingers to the nubs. Burton Harrison, who had been uh, Davis's secretary, arrived at Fort Fortress Monroe with a long-awaited writ of habeas corpus. If you know Latin, habeas corpus means have corpse. In other words, there's a body there. He had been directed to deliver the body, and that's the way it was written, of Jefferson Davis to the Circuit Court of the United States in Richmond on the opening day of court on the second Monday in May, which is very interesting that he has to go to Richmond. Jefferson Davis was brought before the circuit court and released on bail of $100,000 paid by Horace Greeley and other prominent northerners. 
with the expectation that the trial would take place in November. He was never brought to trial. The Davises left for Canada, where they entered easily. She said, even though he had not taken the oath of allegiance to the U.S. and was a citizen of no country. After a joyous reunion with family, they moved into a house in a neighborhood of European immigrants and ex-slaves who had escaped from America before the war. So, it's quite a journey they had there. Mm -hmm. They died in Canada? Nope. The story goes on. Oh, the story goes on. <laughs> the story goes on. Um, and we need to t assess what is going on at this time period. I will tell you that um, in doing the research, what I found an original a book written in 1933, which was the biography of Verena Davis, and talked about the trials and tribulations that she had, um, and glossed over some of the unpleasant aspects of her marriage. The second thing is, if you ever get a chance to read uh, or take at least take a look at. The three volumes, Notable American Women, which we have in our library. There is a write-up about Verena Davis in that one. And again, it speaks of her sharp tongue. She was noted for being a very clever speaker. But she, in my opinion, does not come across as a very sympathetic person. Time passes on, and a new book is written, another one that I would recommend if you have a chance to take a look at it. Um, Women of Invention. I got the title right. Sounds right. Um, the author is now, Drew Helpin is now the president of Harvard University, and she, the mothers of invention. And she takes a look at what life was like for women in the South after the Civil War. So let us just do our summary of what Verena is up against. In the civil, in the southern states where she grew up, what you did in life and what was expected of you depended on cl class, race, and gender. Those were the three basic qualifications when we looked at you and assessed what kind of a person you were going to be. The South is now, as Verena Davis knew it, is now gone. Taking a look at race, this is the period when the carpetbaggers come in. This is the freedom of the slaves, which was an economic basis for the planter class. That basis is now gone, to say nothing of the fact that the Union made sure, thinking of Sherman, that a large part of the Southern economy was destroyed, uh, especially in states like Georgia. So. We see that situation. The planter class is gone. The land is devastated. The money is non-existent. Uh, a woman had previously, who was of the um, planter class, was used to servants and being a subdued person at home. Not expected to be, surprisingly enough, I don't know what they did with the extroverts, but that type of personality was not part of being a Southern woman. So now we see Verena. She is in her 40s. She is the mother of six children. Her husband's wealth is now non-existent. Um, what kind of a job could she hold? What kind of professions were open to women? Slim to none. She did eventually, at one stage of the game, take in sewing. So she has no visible means of support. Six children, a husband who will turn out to have grave difficulty holding a job. And uh, she's a well-known person. The family then goes to Montreal. That turns out to be all right, but her husband is, um, Anxious to earn money makes a lot of sense. And so somehow they have the idea that if they go to England, he will be able to get in touch with former Southerners and will, they will take him into some kind of business. Sounds like a great idea. Did not work at all. Um, however, 
they were treated like celebrities. There were all kinds of Southerners uh, who lived in London especially, and Verena uh, was a heroine, remember? Annis was her husband in the South. In one of her letters, I think one of the saddest things to read was she was so happy to be with people again. But on the other hand, she didn't have modern day clothes, so she looked dowdy in comparison. Uh, for a proud woman, that had to be a difficult situation. Her husband then decides that it probably, this is, though no, they have been there for quite a while, for several years, decides that he will return to the United States to see if he cannot get some kind of a job. That too is a pathetic part of the story. <clears throat> he was too proud to ask for a job and apparently thought all kinds of people would offer him jobs. Well, that didn't happen at all. He did have three occupations and failed in every one of them. Meanwhile, here is Verena in London with the children with no visible means of support, but highly regarded by English society and so invited to parties and what have you. Finding out where their money came from is something I, I have, I looked at some of the information on it, but apparently a lot of Southerners contributed to them because there was pride in Jefferson Davis and his wife. Now there comes a difficult period in the marriage, keeping in mind that divorce for people of that class in the 1870s was probably an unheard of thing. But they live separately. They're not the only two people mm. that do them in that period. Judah Benjamin that we mentioned before also lived in separate situations. Eventually, um, Jefferson Davis says to Verena, all right, it's, it's time for you to come home. We, we notice who is in charge. It's not she that makes the decision to come home. It's his decision. And so she comes home now. She has the children. For some reason, the thought was have her stay in, in one of the plantation areas in Memphis, which was a way of saying to a woman of Verena Davis's education, um, was putting her on the wayside. She was not going to have exciting society parties or any other thing like that. <coughs> Jefferson Davis now manages, after he has been um, the butt of many northern cartoons, as you saw, the one with him with the dress on, which the press used vigorously to deny him. He now, strangely enough, is on a train with Virginia Clay. You heard that name before. This was from um, the arrest of Jefferson Davis and his assistant. And so this is Virginia Clay who strangely enough happens to be on the same train as Jefferson Davis. The conductor reports this situation. Well, the political times were not that much different than they are now, where if we could have a scandal, well, let's have a good one. Um, one of the quotes in it is, uh, People were advised to give Jefferson Davis a wide berth, which I thought was kind of clever. Yeah, I know, bad, bad. Um, and the parts of that are interesting. He never sued, he never did anything, it just kind of vanished. However, here is Verena. Now she is a widow with uh, a husband who it appears we would not want to use the term philandering, but it comes to mind. Um, then, in the next step, uh, one of Jefferson Davis's friends, also a widow, invites him to come to her plantation 
and he will help her, she will help him write his memoirs of the Civil War. Now that's the last way that he's going to have a chance to make money. So he is there with her working on his um, history of the Civil War, or at least of the Confederacy, and Verena is in Memphis. Doesn't look too well. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually he invites Verena, and again we're into who is the controlling person in this situation. He invites Verena to come and live there and help also write the history of the Confederacy. Um, this goes on in the society still. This is their only source of money. Meanwhile, they have had children dying quite regularly along the way, which doesn't add to the good situation. And uh, Jefferson Davis was not in the best of health. At any rate, he dies. The widow here leaves the plantation to Jefferson Davis. Her family, you need to know, sued quite vigorously and lost on that battle. But at least Jefferson Davis' family at this stage of the game begins to have money. Now we see Verena into her 60s, having survived a tremendously changing society, which is, I think, not treated her well. So she makes a major decision and leaves the South and moves to New York City. Causes all kinds of discussion among Southern plantation family. Why would she ever do such a thing? Well, she wasn't the only Southerner that left for New York City. I mean, that was where the action was. She now is beginning um, to make use of all the friends that she has. And among those, Joseph Pulitzer had married into the family, and he had been the recipient of many letters from Verena during her stay in the South. He offers her a job writing for his paper, and she agrees to do it. Now she is making money. This is in 1900. She is now making money on her own except for that brief time that she took in sewing. She is regarded, highly regarded, in New York society. And of course, there are continued celebrations of the Civil War in the South. And Verena is continually invited to attend. She's like a figure. This is Verena Davis, wife of Jefferson Davis. Does she say anything? Probably not. But she attends all of these situations. She has some um, interesting moments. She takes a carriage ride every day up and down Broadway while she's in New York City. One day while uh, vacationing in um, New Jersey, she, there is a knock on her door and uh, she opens it and a woman introduces herself as Julia Dent Grant. This is Ulysses Grant's wife, introduces herself. This is a woman who, after the Civil War, had gone through the Richmond uh, place where Davis had lived. The two of them became friends. She's amazing to me. She also met uh, a couple of, well, many other people. Booker T. Washington was one of them. Um, Booker T. Washington, I think, would be a good person to do research on again. He apparently met everybody, <laughs> um, <laughs> including Susan B. Anthony and George Eastman, among others. He was invited uh, to the Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's White House, and he was for dinner. And that was he was the president was criticized for doing that. Well, Verena had no difficulty meeting Booker T. Washington. I think one of the ones um, that she met that did not have a good opinion of her is um, Betsy Custer, wife of George Armstrong Custer, who considered her to be a very opinionated person. <laughs> and, and by this time, 
the youngest child, the daughter, who was also called Verena Davis, comes to live with her mother. And she is widely regarded. The Southern people invite her all the time to explain what life was like in, uh, in the Old South. She had never lived in the Old Plantation South at all. But she became a respected writer. Verena's writing continues. She writes articles like Christmas in Virginia, Christmas in Richmond. And then she writes a series of self-help columns. Amazing to me if we think that that is, we're the ones that invented that. <laughs> no, Verena was writing those. She now is independently wealthy. Granted, Joseph, the brother-in-law that we all disliked, managed to win in the end by seeing that their original home went to her husband, who left it uh, to his daughter. The daughter eventually dies, and Verena inherits this. Her death um, in, eight, I should say this, among the other people that uh, attempted to talk to her, the founding of the WCTU was a big event at that time. And the WCTU tried to enlist her to start chapters in the South. Well, she would not get involved with them at all. She also had a letter from Susan B. Anthony, again suggesting that perhaps she might be interested in progress uh, for women. One thing of interest that she was, issue that she was involved in, may sound like something new, equal pay for women. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, another hundred years we'll get there. She dies uh, highly regarded but, uh, at 80 years of age, highly regarded in the southern states. Any personality questions are now gone. She is considered by many to be one of the people who attempts to join the north and the south on a social basis. The Beverly Vaughan opinion is, is that before this book was written, which we have in the Benfield Library, I would suggest to you that Verena Davis um, was not given her due. She did, by the way, say that she thought the right side won the Civil War. Ooh, thank you. <laughs>